good afternoon, everybody. Uh, and welcome to uh, our very first uh, chat time. Uh, it is my pleasure to uh, be moderating this session. I am Dr. Natalie Pang. I'm Senior Lecturer at the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences at National University of Singapore, uh, as well as ex-co member uh, of the Singapore Heritage Society. Uh, it is also um, a great pleasure to be part of the CCHA Board of Directors as well. Um, so I'd like to, uh, I guess, introduce uh, this upcoming series of uh, what we call Chart Time. Um, and this series, uh, the theme of the talks uh, is building climate resiliency through local community wisdom. Essentially, we will, we will host a series of talks about uh, the role of heritage, especially in addressing uh, the issue of climate change. Uh, today's topic uh, is um, uh, I'm very uh, proud to introduce uh, Mr. Chatu Yavis uh, Sutupan uh, or Kun Gift, who is a Thai architect and director of the Creative Economy Agency in Northeast Thailand. He's also uh, the founder of Bangkok-based Site Specific. Uh, his talk will last about 30 to 45 minutes. And um, I would like to invite everyone uh, who have questions uh, during his talk to make use of the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window uh, to post your questions. We will, uh, we will have about uh, 15 to 20 minutes for the Q&A session at the end of this um, seminar. Um, I would now like to invite uh, Mr. Nguyen Dok Tang, uh, who is CCHA Board of Director from Vietnam, as well as Deputy Director of the Center for Research and Promotion of Cultural Heritage of Vietnam, to introduce CCHA. Mr. Tang, please. Thank you, Dr. Natalie. Uh, good everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, to our colleagues, uh, to all the organizers, uh, moderators, speakers, and all of our audiences who are participating uh, in today's event. Um, as introduced by Dr. Natalie, my name is Tang uh, from the Center for Research and Promotion of uh, Cultural Heritage uh, from Vietnam. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the Board of Directors of the Southeast Asia Cultural Heritage Alliance, CICHA, for giving me the honor to welcome you all to this event. It has been uh, nearly one year since last December uh, when the seven founding members met online to announce the inception of AHA, ASEAN Heritage Alliance, the former name of CICHA as we know it right now. And it was a, a memorable and exciting moment for us to discuss, to set forth the mission, the objectives, the criteria for the membership and basic uh, working procedure for th this org organization. The seven founding members of Shicha are the Indonesian Heritage Trust, the Penan Heritage Trust, the Yangon Heritage Trust, the Heritage Conservation Society of the Philippines, the Singapore Heritage Society, the Siam Society under Royal Patronage from Thailand, and the Center for Research Promotion of Cultural Heritage in Vietnam. As a meaningful initiative, uh, Shicha established in advocacy for the ASEAN Declaration on Cultural Heritage, which was signed by the ASEAN in Bangkok in the year 2000. As a non-profit organization, a digital-based network of Southeast Asian civil society organizations, Shicha is dedicated for active engagement in the preservation and the safeguarding of cultural heritage across the region and hopefully beyond in the future. Shija commits itself into a threefold mission. First is to serve as a forum for robust discourse on heritage among heritage uh, professional practitioners, civil society and community organizations, and interest member of the general public and to promote public awareness of the importance of the protection of heritage as a vital component of national and regional sustainable development. Second is to be a think tank and resource center to support the policies of ASEAN nations and ASEAN itself uh, to decision makers in heritage through a variety of activities, 
including research, analysis, consultation, training, seminars, conferences, and to highlight key issues in heritage preservation and promotion. And we act as a bridge between heritage interests, the goals of the people, and business and government. CJA also gears its activities towards the development of heritage management programs in ASEAN to place cultural heritage at, in the heart of the, the ASEAN community building efforts and to join hands in bringing about creative solutions to protect heritage sites from damaging commercialization and urbanization. This is set forth in the Vientiane Declaration by ASEAN. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, mankind have witnessed tremendous changes in recent years, especially in the year 2019 and 1920. We are struggling in times of severe calamities caused by nature and by ourselves. Nevertheless, for thousands of years, humankind survives thanks to his capacity for resilience and creativity. These are the two root elements of all cultural heritage domains, in my belief. And I will believe that they will continue to lead us the way through all the challenges and move toward a sustainable future. This is why Sicha decided to open a series of talk we call Tea Time. So as you are sipping uh, your own delicious tea uh, in front of you, so uh, this is the very first uh, tea time. And uh, as Dr. Nan Natalie uh, also mentioned that uh, we have the first session under the theme, building climate uh, resiliency through local community wisdom. Uh, so uh, I, I hope that uh, it will bring some perspectives for, uh, for further consideration and, and discussion. So I wish you, before I leave the floor to, uh, to uh, Dr. Natalie Pang, I would like to wish you a successful um, seminar discussions and with fruitful uh, results. Thank you very much and I wish you all with good health and safety. Thank you. Thank you Mr. Tang um, for the introduction to uh, Sicha as well as this series of talk that we call Cha Time. Uh, I would like to uh, invite uh, Kun Gif to uh, uh, share his uh, video and screen uh, and uh, Kun Gif please. Hi, thank you for a very lovely um, uh, introduction. Um, as we know already, I'm, I'm an architect based in Bangkok, Thailand, and I've been working on the issues of water and how we live with water for about you know, 12 years now. And what comes about is really we you know we only have one world and the way we are currently living we are starting to consume the equivalent of two worlds and by the uh, in the next 10 years by 2030 um, we will reach that capacity and there's no way that we can escape anywhere else except you know, we have to live in the one world that we have. So as we know it, our world is really sick. And one of the reasons is that we, the biggest problem that we are facing is global warming. And the global warming is really caused by us human. Um, we have occupied much of the world and we have depleted much of, much of our resources. Um, but as we all know, um, Southeast Asian nations and Thailand especially, um, our society is always found along the rivers. And these are map of the rivers in the, no in the, in the central, north and northeast of Thailand. Um, the beginning of my research, we only look at the central plain which is area of Bangkok and north of Bangkok, mostly along Chao Phraya River. Um, you know, we always know how to live with water. You know, we build raft houses, you know, that comes, you know, with up and down along with 
the level of water. Um, you know, we built clongs, you know, canals um, into the cities and use it as, you know, our transportation market, you know, and our lives really always depended on the water and the canals and the rivers. But um, in our current world, uh, if you look at this diagram that I've created a while back, um, in the old time on the left side, um, from even before the Ayutthaya kingdom, you know, the period of the ancient Thailand, um, we always live along the river with water. And, you know, boat were, made, were our main transportation mode. And um, our house sit on stilt. And when the water comes, you know, it just gets flooded uh, below the, our house. The boat come right up to the house and, you know, we figure out, yes, the water actually is a good resource for nutrients for our rice paddies and field, right? And then during about the reign of King Rama IV, Bangkok start to get modernized. We built Charon Krung Road, the first, the first paved modern road in Thailand, and which was named, you know, which was called in English, New Road up really until about maybe six, seven years ago when we decided to adopt the name Charon Krung Road even in English. Um, and that when you know, the water start to become problem and flood actually is a become, became a problem. Um, from then on, you know, we, our transportation development has been uh, by the train or using a car's transportation. Um, dur during the 19, late 70s, early 80s, Thailand want to become, wanted to become a newly industrialized country. Um, so we start by importing technologies such, such as um, car assembly from Japan. Um, instead of actually invent our, our own technologies, we just adopt it and become kind of like a, an assembly hub because it's the quickest way to become industrialized. So in order to support that market of the, the, of the supply of the cars that we wanted. So instead of actually building public transportation, we decided to build roads. And that always has become kind of like our main goal of development. It's very American style, you know, you build highway, you build roads. And the houses where it used to face canal now actually face the street instead. Houses where used to be up on stilts now is on the ground level for transportation, for trades, you know, because basically we, now, uh, we are now using road as main transportation. So from there, um, we start talking about climate change. At that time, um, the issue of global warming wasn't really proved then yet. Uh, we start to build elevated railways, you know, because at that time also there was a discussion that we couldn't build subway in Bangkok because it will get the system will get flooded so easily. Um, but after the elevated train was done, you know, the underground the MRT open, um, we decide that oh, we know how to actually control the water, and then we realized not too long ago, about eight years ago now, that we can't manage water. Um, there's no way that human can fight with nature. And so this is kind of like a brief a history of how urban development in Thailand and relationship of water becomes a problem. So this is the image of New Road, Jeroen Grung, actually right by my main office in Bangkok now. I live in the neighborhood, I have two offices there. Um, you know, in the beginning, it was rickshaw, you know, uh, trikes and cars. You start seeing the image of cars here now. Um, and then, you know, trams, right? So people are, so uh, now basically everyone's in Bangkok turned their back into the canals. Because, because the canal became just sewers, right? Where people kind of like dump the toilet water 
and you know, re tow their, really threw their trash into the river. Um, but you know, it's still an old plane. We're still living in a row lying plane along the river. So flood water did happen sometimes. In the old day, it was acceptable that once in a while the city would get flooded. And when it gets flooded, it actually become quite uh, a festivities, really. People come, you know, we did this to kind of like Mr. Ode. People come out with their boats, wet beds to had it, you know, and actually they go around the cities, you know, using the boat. Uh, this is all the monuments, you know, around Bangkok. Uh, and really one of the first factory also is, uh, you know, people, you can see that actually the, the, the factory is dry because there was already a belief that, yes, you need to elevate it, the platform, you know, the grounds where we'll build something that we want to keep dry. And that's also um, re create the, the problem of flooding, you know, into other areas. Back to this uh, diagram, it's, so what right now we are you know building one of the tallest buildings in the world the project might get canceled you know due to COVID-19 but you know here we are and and now that uh we are here what how do we imagine living in a city as such, such as Bangkok uh, in the future The generation that goes to 7-Eleven, you know, with their motorbike to buy their groceries, they don't go to market anymore. And the generation that actually goes to a factory and work, you know, after they stop at 7-Eleven for their breakfast and come back, you know, to 7-Eleven. So in the beginning, this is way before the big flood happened in 2012, 2013. Um, we had an idea, do, um, we, we founded a, a, a think tank called Design for Disasters, some of you may have heard. And Design for Disasters is basically a group of designers, young politicians, um, doctors, lawyers, um, basically a bunch of people who all are interested to using a design, uh, design as tools to solve uh, some of the problems that we are facing. Uh, we, we met, you know, at that time was once a month to discuss the issue that we want to tackle. One of the issues that was raised was really global warming and the rising of sea levels. And this is the map where you can see that if the different level of sea, if the sea rises um, at different levels, um, how far inland would actually the sea reach. But what's really funny also is that about only about 2,500 years ago, the level, the last one on the left, the five meters level was actually where the sea originally was. Bangkok and the plains around us didn't exist um, then. Um, the lands that we are currently living in is very young compared to you know, the history or, or the creation of this world and of our earth. And, and, you know, 2,500 years ago, Bangkok didn't exist, but now we are living in that land. Is this land, you know, temporarily, you know, is the sea going to take over, you know, what, what, what one once was the sea? And that's the question we started, we, we were tackling you know, from different points of views. But this is a sample of very traditional house in, in the Middle Plains, Thailand. Um, it's on still, you know, this is basically during the, well, it's not a flood season. You're, it's, we call it the wet season, the dry season. So the wet season, you expect to have water. It wasn't a flood, it was just water. So it was wet, right? It wasn't a problem. It just was a, just a part of, of the cycle of life. Um, so we figure out how to live with flood in Central Plain. You know, it was very intelligent. You know, house were raised on still, you know, you come out, you can go to your field, you can go to your um, yard, you can go, you know, when, the, when it's flat, you can go to a higher ground with your boat 
and then you can actually live you know among the natures and among your ecology ecosystems but in south in southern thailand there's also another um, type of house it was actually a house that built on bamboo rafts and this is the area in Thakhanon, in Suratani, in southern Thailand, where they actually get flash floods from rainwater into the valleys. So this is up in uh, mountain valleys. So once in a while, they would get flash floods and it goes up to about um, 10 meters in some cases. So instead of building house on stills, on still, they would build houses on a bamboo raft. And you can see the ropes that you know, when they, they would know when the flood would come just by, you know, their own instinct. And then at, at that, at, and then they would actually keep the watch out. And then when the flood levels comes, you know, they would actually just release the, the rope and allows the houses to flow up along with the, with the water. And then once the water subsides, you know, the house will actually come down and they start pulling the house and come back to the same location again. Only about three or four of these houses still exist. Most of them cannot really float anymore because it, it does require a lot of maintenance to, to maintain all these bamboo rafts. It needs to be replaced every three years or so. Um, so it, it is quite a big maintenance for them. But you can see in the old days that all the houses were built like that, you know, or a lot in this village. Um, so from there, you know, the global warming was our big concern. The rising of sea levels was our big concern. And Chao Phya River was really our main focus because, you know, it was a project that, that we had to kind of like determine where we would tackle first because um, different areas re require different kind of thinking and Javia River estuary from the diagrams, you know, would be one of the first places to actually become a really big problem, you know, if the sea rises um, high enough. So the solution for us was that we can't really build houses on stilt anymore because houses that used to be built on stilt now get converted and the ground floor will uh, do get um, cover up and get walled out and become living space. Um, even if we ask them to build how on stilts again, and then you know if we didn't get flat for a couple of years, uh, they still want to make extension on the ground floor because it's the easiest way and cheapest way to make extension. So our goal was that the generation that go to 7-Eleven and work in factory, no matter what, they want to live on the ground. So we decided that, that you know, the probable solution is you know, to make house that actually float with water, just what we saw in Takanon, in Suratani, but using more modern technologies. So our first houses was actually built on kind of like steel pontoon. Um, with on a platform and with the roof that actually the butterfly shaped roof allow us to catch water uh, when we need it. So basically the house could actually sit um, in the water and can be self-sustained for a pretty extended period of time. Um, we can have solar, we can have power from solar and wind turbine on the roof. The water can get collected and get uh, the rainwater and get collected and feed into the water tank up above and actually using the gravity to feed water down into the toilets or uh, the kitchen where as needed. And the house was built really light using um, steel structures and, and, and uh, cement board uh, walls. Um, and then there's also a septic system within the pontoon itself so that the water uh, get treated um, before it get released into the flood water. And basically all the undercarriage that floats up and down is sitting underground. So you, when you walk around, you actually don't see that this house so is so much different than others. And only when the water comes, um, these houses do get rises and, and you know, flow up with water. But you know, you can't so you couldn't you can't survive with just you know one floating house. You have to look at the 
entire community as a whole. And so basically we created different types of architecture from commercial shops to residential and commercial to basically multi-purpose area. The idea is that if the relief efforts do come into this area, all they need to do is just to the, to the main multi-purpose area and you know, uh, all the supplies can be supplied to that location and everyone else can actually come and get uh, uh, their, their, their supply, relief supplies from there. Um, the commercial areas also need to be maintained because whatever food that exists in that, in that area need to be saved so that uh, during the flood, they still have food and supply. They don't actually won't need so much of the relief outside. So they can be self-sustained for a while. Um, so yeah, so we imagine kind of like an image, uh, a, a village of uh, amphibious architecture that could happen you know, within the central plains of Thailand. Um, and we do get, we do go out. We actually do go work on the field. We, you know, survey different, di different uh, communities around central plains. We send in students. We do have project in, in the school to try to get, you know, as, much, as many ideas as possible. We work with, you know, different architects, you know, from Chat. Uh, Shat Pong on the left to some of our students from you know on the roof but we 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 think of mostly uh urban area but we do also go out into the countryside to do a survey also because even the countryside of Thailand now doesn't have a real rural life anymore it just a more how shall I say it a um, less dense urban life, living. It's not a true rural. It's not a true rural living anymore. People still, you know, rely on uh, cities. You know, Seven Eleven and and shops. You know, no one really go out and really get all their food from the fields anymore. And then this happened. This was an image. Oh, the credit is wrong. This was my image. I actually got lucky enough to get invited to go see the Pumipon Dam at its full capacity before the water got released. And this happened, the flood of 2011, no, 2000, 2012. Um, Bangkok got flooded. We never imagined that this could happen, you know? We always thought, hey, it's just water, we can control it. But you can see that it um, doesn't matter how many dams we build, doesn't matter how many, how many rivers, you know, or how many walls we build around, along the river, nature will find its way, you know. Water is, it's liquid. It will find its own way. So, you know, we start experimenting with the ideas of, you know, using things around ourselves one being just really what we consider is trash, you know, at that time um, before it kind of like this recycling, upcycling become kind of like at a good capacities in Thailand at the moment, as, as good as this to, uh, today. Um, you know, we collected bottled water and, and, you know, try to see how can we use regular items around our houses to make kind of like this survival um, system, you know, just plastic bags, really plastic bag, full of them um, can make really kind of like a floaties for young children, you know, um, wash basins that everyone has, you know, tied together can become a life raft, you know, so ones can actually commute, you know, within a small village, you know, quite easily. So a project, you know, we will survive, you know, is basically a collections of ideas that happened during that flood, you know, from really human ingenuity um, that we see around, uh, that we see ourselves solving during the flood, you know, uh, you know, from how, you know, we built uh, lock or dams basically to prevent water from going from one to another, you know, using a double wall system, um, 
how we make uh, toilets out of plastic uh, chairs, you know, how we build a raft easily so that, you know, we can actually create a biogas kitchen, you know, from our own waste. Um, you know, if there are live why, how do actually we adapt it, you know, those area, you know, into, um, to, to make uh, uh, electricity, to, to adapt it, uh, electricity to be used again, or, you know, how do we actually store valuable things, you know, that potentially could get collected. Um, the samples, for example, for, for boats, you know, from one side to another, sometimes you can't, uh, you by yourself and you can't get from one side to another, um, or, you know, how to lift the boats, you know, simply with just a couple of things, you know. So it's it's collection of ideas, you know, that we did. And we also went out and record of a live invention, you know, around Bangkok and actually around Central Plains, you know, two chairs, you know, can become basically your sandals that rise, that, that raise you above, above the flood water, you know, or you need, you know, if you want to build a higher um, rickshaw, you know, to carry stuff around, you know, people do that. And, you know, when the, um, the, the, the swan in, in the garden, you know, doesn't really apply as pleasure anymore. If you attach it with an engine, it actually can become a boat. So after the flood, we were approached by National Housing Authority in Thailand. And so from there, from that, from the flood, from the big flood, um, the rising of sea level, we used to think that the water would be coming from the sea. And then we human could actually manage the fresh water. But as we can see with the big flood problem, we couldn't. And, and the, what, what we thought that the water would actually just come from the, from the sea. Now we also, as a city, we also get water from the mountain and it actually gets just pool. So the area of the lowing flat plain is actually, um, does, it's not just applied to a central plain anymore. We used to think that, you know, cities like Chiang Mai, Kampang, Pet, Osuko, Thai, you know, uh, weren't our focus area, but as we can see, even this just past week that we get real big flash flood in the mountains in the northeast of Thailand. Um, we do get, uh, and from this diagram, actually, we do get flood, flood everywhere in Thailand. So this is the, the 10 years from 2045, you know, Thai years to 2054. So which was about you know, 10 years ago. Um, this was the map that proved that the flood, the flood problem is everywhere in Thailand. What we consider a normal situation no longer exists. You know, it, it, it's always new because with global warming, we are always gonna get a new uh, condition that we didn't know exist. Some politicians, said that we need to wage war against nature. And, you know, us as human, why are we so arrogant and say that, hey, you know, nature is so much bigger than us. We're just a tiny little dots, you know, on this planet. Um, who are we to wage a war against nature? But we need to learn to live with nature instead. This is a sample of Talatali in Supanburi in just about an hour and a half west of Bangkok. In the old days, the market actually sits on two levels. One on the ground where you can actually see this cart here. That is during the dry season. Um, the market would just be on the ground level. People can just walk around on dry ground and dry land. But when the flood water comes, the, all the, the entire market, the entire village actually get move up to a second floor, even including, as you can see that uh, the ESO gas station sign, everything get moved to the second floor only for the about three months period during the wet season. 
So uh, we always know how to adapt our cities, even or our town, you know, to work with nature. And there was one, of course, government, uh, pro got one governor of Supanburi said that, um, you know, living that way, you know, with the flood, it's an old way, it's no lifestyle. Let's try to make the city dry. And so now Tali has the same problem with all, with everywhere else in, Bang in Thailand is that, um, the flood has become a problem. You can see that two, the two level houses still sits, uh, market still sits on the left side, while you know this flood prevention program actually happened, was happening around town. But same thing with national housing agencies is that they only built one type of houses. You know, sits on the ground. They built thousands of these. They all look alike. And they don't take considerations of, you know, different situation or different um, locations or different environments. What we were trying to convince them to do is really to think, rethink of how the National Housing Agency houses can be different. Um, we propose four different designs. All of them actually comes from a workshop that we did with uh, the residents of National Housing Agencies itself. And then through that process, uh, we actually asked them to help us design these houses and see how they actually want these houses to be. So for example, you know, the ones that they picked was the one at, you know, that has really weird shapes because, uh, and I'll, I'll explain to you later, because the, these weird shapes allow the houses to basically face any directions, but still receive enough uh, cross ventilation, enough lights to come through, but they want to make a bit of adjustment so that the weird angle actually become a bit more regular in the beginning. Also, their recommendation was that they need an easier maintenance for the undercarriage system that floats up. So instead of having banana shape, as we call it, um, pontoon, we change it to more of a cubula shape pontoon. Um, so the result is this, is this funny shape house. But this funny shape house allowed this house basically to be built and face any direction. All the adjustment they have to do is really just the, this screen will have four different shapes for four different directions that the house uh, faces, um, basically to block the direct sunlight into the house. And this is the image of the pontoon and the carriage that, uh, that we actually were, that we took photograph during the testing. Um, we we took we took quite it would it took quite about while to build this house you know because it was done uh, and test at the same time, but at the end, um, this is the image uh, this is the image of the house floating when we were testing it. There was a man who lived across these houses that he said that he wanted to write this house when it goes up uh, with the water. So when we were testing it, basically pumping the water onto the, into, into this out pit, um, he decided that he wants to come sit on one corner and ride up with, uh, with the architecture. So, so he'll come soon. So, he'll, so he comes and, you know, and he just wants to sit there. And then, you know, talking around and said, oh, you know, he wishes his house can be like that. Uh, so anyway, so from then on, you know, we start looking at, uh, at a much, much bigger problem. Actually, this is prior to even to uh, the houses in HA. We already start to look at the much bigger problem. This is another flood that, this is another village that get flooded. It's only this yellow area that get flooded all the time, every year. They, they figure out how to live with water. So during the flood, you know, they would actually build this temporary bridge and then everyone bring their boats, you know, they go into their still house, you know, which is fine. 
But you know, other areas where the cities want they, they wanted to protect it die, they, they just built walls along the river to try to basically increase the value volume of the river. So you can see that outside this wall, the house get flooded, but inside the house get uh, stay uh, the cities stay really dry. So we did we did the research to try to studies of how the flood water comes, and we got a few interns from Harvard GSD that comes and work with us. And this was the period where before the drone actually became kind of like widespread. So we actually just used balloons to take photographs of the ground of the of the village. And basically, from the studies, we can see that you know houses were built differently differently in different heights. And how it copes with floods um, uh, is different way. For example, like houses number six, no matter what they said, they want to live, you know, on the ground floor. Also, they get flooded every year, and every year they say, "Hey, you know, they just need to clean it up." And then you can see the line right here where the water level was. And then what they do also is that um, they would have outlets that they need to be taken out on a yearly basis and roll up into the ceiling. Um, so, you know, they, they figure out that they can live with water um, all year round, you know, in, in this rural area. And then, um, so we were trying to see the data to kind of like understand the general standing of, of all these conditions of how it happens. Basically to get an idea of if we really need to live full time, which means all year round with water, how can we create these self-containing communities? And so basically, you know, the, the, our next project is to look at kind of like a full time floating village and start to see if, if a village would exist like this, how would we need to do it? We would need energy, power, we would need food, we, you know, so we would need school, community centers, and religious places. But also what's really important is that how do we create um, clean water? So this is kind of like a, mod, a sample module of a house that you have a residential area, you have your garden, you have your fisheries, you have this dome where it actually um, create, basically it's create a clean water, clean drinking water just by basically create a condensation from water from under from under you. You can grow your rice, you can have your farm, you can have your chicken, you know, and anything can really be adopted into this floating uh, area. Even big concrete houses can float. Um, basically, so then we would divide into a more specialties uh, villages that combine to one, one, one big uh, one big community is that so that this specialty is with this village to grow rice. This is for aquaculture, for reservoir, basically creating, you know, uh, clean, clean water from evaporations um, and one for power only. And all these can combine and basically create a self-sustaining village. Um, but then, but, you know, looking at a much bigger idea is that well, if we have to stay in Bangkok and we will stay in Bangkok, how would Bangkok cope with the water? You know, this is Wulampong Station. Um, during flood, people actually take the boat in, onto the train to come to the train because the train, the train line is always above the water. Most, not always, almost always above the water. So we try to look at the area where, you know, it's really close to our heart. Our office is basically this blue spot here. And this is basically Hulampong train station here. And this is a canal that is dividing line between what's considered an old town Bangkok to what is what we consider actually uh, a, a modern Bangkok. So this canal is basically the third level, uh, the third uh, what you call it, fortification canal for uh, the old Bangkok. Um, and what we look at this is that you can see the diagram on the, the map on the left is that Bangkok has lots of canal and it still does have lots of canal. We just don't notice and we just don't see it anymore. And we see it as kind of like a sewer, you know, and we see it as um, basically a, 
a, a trash can, really. So what we're trying to do is really to make people notice this, uh, the canal again, and also trying to incre increase the volume of this canal so that it can become um, basically the, the, the reservoir for when the flood water comes and it can actually, it, it can become where the flood uh, can, can, can go into Bangkok. Uh, and so basically, you know, the main train station will get moved outside of town into about that area um, where, you know, we are finishing up uh, the, the new central train station. So they don't, they won't really need much of the train to come into town anymore. So they, they only need a couple of train lines. So the area can actually get turned into a park. It's a very, very, it will be a very expensive park, but I think that area do, do need a park. And then instead of actually having the roads on the side, on the banks anymore, or really kind of like a hard wall on the back of river banks, uh, it become a linear park so that it can provide alternative transportation either by uh, boats in the canal or it can become a bicycle lanes or really just walkable distance so that people can actually connect to different areas of Bangkok. One thing about Bangkok is that if you look at this diagram, it's really, it's really easy to come into Bangkok this way. It's very centralized, but if you want to get from this point to this point in Bangkok, it's not the easiest way to do. So this canal with this Lini Park can provide this mode of this alternative mode of transportation. And we also try to connect, you know, different sort of public area and really give it back to the public, you know. And basically this is diagram of the, uh, the ideas that on the dry season, the water level is low so that, you know, it, uh, the park has a full capacity, you know, you can actually use it for leisure and entertainment. But during the flood season, the park actually get filled up and it becomes, um, uh, uh, it becomes a, oh shit, it's long. Uh, it, it gets filled up and it, it's become kind of like a reservoir. So, sorry, Kungis, uh, I think we have about three minutes left. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll wrap it up, sorry. Okay. Um, so, so this is um, this is basically the image of that park that we're trying to provide the transportation, uh, the, the 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 alternative, you know, to to uh, to the water solution, trying to make uh, Bangkok as amphibious as it could be. Uh, this is a summary already. Um, one thing for us is that you know we think that architecture is really not. The, what we do is that we, we don't think that architecture is a, is a trophy of one success in capitalist society. It's not basically a service where we build houses for the rich, even though 90% of architect does that. Um, we want to be that one that one percent to actually use it as a tool to resolve, to resolve uh, you know, our society's problems. And what's really is important for us is really the happiness of people, you know, in times of flood in the biggest problem possible, you know, people try to smile. And this might be a high thing, but, you know, we start, we try to make, you know, the best out of the worst situation. And, and what I want to emphasize on is that we really need to stay creative and we really need to live sustainably. And thank you very much. Thank you, Kungit. Uh, thank you. I, I really enjoyed, thoroughly enjoyed your lecture. Um, you. It was so inspiring. And what really struck me is just how, uh, what I learned is just how uh, architecture is really about the people. And uh, I mean, during, in the context of climate, this climate emergency, how it can um, also, yeah, I mean, help our population basically to uh, adapt. Uh, there's a couple of uh, really great questions coming through. Uh, I'll just jump right onto the questions. Yeah. Um, from Prof. Widodo, uh, talking about the culture, uh, I, I love that you end up on that note as well. 
right? Uh, and uh, he asked if uh, cultural factors such as Sanuk, which is, I, I, I think, uh, as you were reflecting a little at the end, yeah. is very much uh, embedded in the Thai cultural in yeah. DNA, right? Do you think that that uh, plays uh, an essential role in terms of uh, the kinds of creativity, you know, the, the kinds of solutions uh, they were exhibiting and the kinds of resilience that they were showing, uh, yeah, in during the disasters and like the yeah. floods. Yeah, thank, thank you, Dr. Guidodo for that, uh, for that questions. And I think it's very evident, I think in Thailand, even we always trying to use kind of like this happiness or this sanuk or laughter, you know, to try to, to face the worst case scenarios. And, and I think that um, Thai ingenuity does really come out from that, you know, areas. I don't think, you know, any other cultures, especially the West would actually strap, you know, two chairs onto their feet and say, hey, that, those are, you know, shoes for flood, you know, and this is something that I think maybe only happened with the Thais or, you know, or, or culture, culture of Southeast Asia. Mm. Yeah, so uh, I, I guess uh, on that note also, um, it is, I, I guess, a question of whether or not we can um, sort of uh, spread this culture, sure. right? Yeah, to the rest of the world uh, so that uh, other populations can also, um, yeah, learn or, or increase their resilience, community resilience. Sure. Um, there is uh, another question that comes that has to do with uh, the people as well. So yeah. uh, this question comes from uh, Frau Kras. Sorry okay. if I mispronounced your name. Um, which is about your, I think during your talk, you uh, showed a lot of uh, evidence and, and your work in terms of how sure. you interacted with the local communities in understanding sure. their needs and preferences. Yes. Um, how did you, uh, yeah, I guess, approach them? Uh, and were there like, uh, you know, intentional um, uh, ways that you, by which you involve diverse uh, people and how do you manage uh, I guess potential tensions that can sure. come out as well. Well, we 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 do we do face uh, tension all the time, but it, we think that actually is important. Um, our project, our, our our projects, even for you know uh, commission work for you know wealthy clients, it's always trying to get the client as involved as possible to really understand their needs. So we do series of workshop with them. And the process is really kind of like a co-creation where we actually um, really go into their communities and you know, design a series of workshops to try to get the ideas out of that. Um, we did it as far as really build a full-scale um, mock-up to some of the projects, you know, of course, with alternative uh, materials. And it's an, and depending on how, for, for example, for some project that we, we go in, you know, without them knowing, example, for, to work with slum, we probably would go in with the children first to start to do um, workshop with the children to allow them to create a map to build model for their communities. A lot of them, because it's really easy to adapt to invite the kids to come. And then once the kids get interested, uh, the parents would actually also get interested in you know, a couple of weeks later and they would come and see, hey, where should their children go? You know, what do they do? You know, and once they get involved, you know, and then they, they start to become involved. And, and the process takes a long time. And none of our project is, you know, it's a short period. We are not very good at designing, you know, a house within three months. We are most of our projects takes takes a couple of years, you know, for it to finish because of that the involvement process. Um, thanks, uh, Kun Gift. Uh, there's a couple of questions. I'll just ask them uh, sure. together because I think uh, both questions has to do with the question of scaling up. Sure. Uh, a, a lot of this work, uh, your work. Um, seem uh, mostly to take place in smaller communities sure. uh, and uh, the the question here is uh, whether you have uh, you know done any research in the you know uh, in the context of uh, perhaps 
uh, high density areas uh, and perhaps yeah, high density solutions. Yeah. And a related a question that comes from James is also how these ideas for amphibious houses can be implemented yeah. on a broader scale, sure. especially in terms of a uh, cost as well sure. as, yeah, I mean, governmental, sure. uh, I, I guess, involvement. Sure. Um, well, for the cost and the mass scale is that um, the system that we use is prefabrication. So when, it's actu when it is actually a bigger scale, um, this, the cost do comes down. Currently, um, the upper portion of the house is exactly the same price as normal steel house. Only the and undercarriage part that's more expensive than traditional foundation. And that area is about 50% more expensive. So let's say the foundation is 30% of the cost of the house. Um, so, so yeah, so the house is roughly about 15% um, more, more than, tra than the traditional house at the moment. And yeah, to scale up is we need, we need to work uh, in, in terms of really mass produce and, and prefabrication technologies. We do have a conference that I co-found with uh, uh, Dr. Chris at, at Delft and uh, Dr. Elizabeth English at um, New University of Waterloo. It's called ICAD, I-C-A-A-D-E. We meet every two weeks, uh, every two years and it's International Conference on Amphibious Architecture, Desi Amphibious Architecture Design and Engineering. Um, and the first one was actually hosted in Bangkok uh, about five years ago, oh, six years ago now because this year is canceled. And then last year it was hosted in uh, Canada at the University of Waterloo, two years ago, sorry. And then um, next one we'll probably host it in, uh, in the Netherlands. And, and basically, um, yes, we, we, there's not that many architects that involve with amphibious architecture. There are a lot of architects that, that works with floating architecture, but amphibious is different things. I think we can, we can probably say that about 30 people that come to this conference who are actually really seriously working on amphibious architecture. Mm. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, sure. We, we, if everyone is okay, uh, we'll perhaps uh, spend another five minutes with the questions. Uh, yeah, um, there's a couple of technical questions over here. Sure. Uh, and the first uh, is, I'll just ask them together. Uh, sure. The first is whether or not that you think that there, there, in, in your work, uh, there's any difference in terms of building materials uh, that's used for building above water on the sea, yeah. on the river and the swamp, uh, right? Um, and the other, questions um, has to do with the effect of water erosion uh, yeah. and whether in your, in your work, uh, your take on the effects of such water er yeah. er erosion on the um, uh, building structures. Yeah. Um, well, what, what, we, what we see is really, it's not, I'm a sailor. So it's, for me, it's not different than actually owning a boat. It's, it's a little expensive, but it, it can be maintained. Um, basically, it's, you know, you have steel hull boat that needs to be repainted, you know, to do protection from corrosion of uh, seawater. Um, it's the same thing with our undercarriage system is that our, our undercarriage system are mostly uh, concrete, actually, uh, Portland cement. And really only our floating system is um, steel encased foam. Um, the foam is there really not to allow it to float, but it's there to allow to prevent water from entering our, um, our pontoon so that you know, we don't get water weight into our uh, system. And, and basically, you know, that, and it's also allowed that the steel encasement is very light, it's only one millimeter steel. So that's also allowed the float to be replaced if needed. The house can all be jacked up and actually get replaced. So maintenance is, it's, yes, it requires different maintenance than a regular house, but the system is designed so that they can all be maintained and replaced. 
Yeah, thank you. Uh, there is a question from Prof. Hank Hoffman, Frank Hoffman, yes. uh, which has to do with uh, yeah existing uh, mitigations. Uh, so in in areas where clear water supply uh, can often be disrupted by the flooding. Um, his question is, what are the existing technologies that are in place to uh, mitigate the problem? Right. Uh, for instance, is it uh, feasible to uh, save and store rainwater in advance of a flood? Yeah. Mm. Th Thai community store waters already, you know, we, I mean, especially in rural area. I actually, even my house in central Bangkok, we have, you know, big um, jugs that sits alongside of our house that we store rainwater for uh, our daily use. And, and yeah, I think it's, it's always feasible to store water, rainwater and it can be done so that even the rainwater system actually doesn't have to go up with, uh, with the house. You know, it can stay in the ground. Basically it's just a tank, right? And the tank can actually float up by itself so that it can be an ind independent system that 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 so the, the water actually you know comes with the house but doesn't really put any weights onto the house itself mm, yeah uh well uh in the interest of time uh i will uh take two more questions uh, for kun um the i think uh this question is quite important especially in the uh, context of uh, local implementations, uh, which is, uh, I think uh, this is coming from Pong, and he is uh, asking if, yeah, I mean, in terms of implementing this idea into uh, operationalizing this idea, um, and in the case of Thailand, right, what kind of support do you think is uh, crucial, uh, especially from uh, the Thai government, and uh, if there's anything uh, that's anything, anything more uh, mm -hmm. that the government needs to do uh, to make this kind of projects uh, successful. Yeah, well, well, one one thing about Thai government, and I'm working for a Thai government agencies now, um, is that uh, most Thai government agencies are a bit um, retroactive, you know, so the problem has to happen first, and then they'll really scramble to find a solution. And that's why NHA actually was interested in our solutions, you know, and, and, and even, you know, allow us to build a prototype, you know, sponsor us really on that research. And, and yeah, but the flood problem didn't really happen in Thailand for a long time. So now everyone's focused on something else. I think what we need to do is really think seriously Bangkok's going to get flood, you know. I think Indonesia is already, you know, really taking into that step. Uh, our prime minister has said at once that we are trying, they, they, that he will make a study of alternative mm. um, solutions for, you know, having a capital somewhere else, but Bangkok's gonna get flood. And we need to think seriously that if we are going to stay in Bangkok, how will we live there, here? And, and yes, I think government agencies such as Man Bangkok Metropolitan Agent, uh, BMT, you know, has to be, I think the host really, because they are the one who, gen who has the biggest interest in, in the city. And then the central government need to support that idea. Um, thank you. Thank you, Kung Um sure. There is one last question. I, I sure. think uh, this is interesting because it has to do with the intersection uh, between uh, architecture and, uh, uh, I, I guess, cultural culture sure. as well. So uh, this question comes from Gary, uh, which is, uh, I mean, he reflects that uh, a lot of our livelihoods and religion, they are so intertwined. Yeah. Um, and if you have any of your projects, explore this amphibious architecture from the spirituality aspect like actually instance, the temples in Bangkok. yeah yeah i i, I yeah I, I mean any really any structure can float if we see you know cruise ship which is the biggest floating structures in the world you know they're as big as you know, empire state building so really we can build anything but for me from the special spiritual level is more has to do with with you know, amphibious house is really to have like to save the livelihood of the people. It's really to um, be there so that, 
you know, they are safe, their family is safe, but also their belongings, their memories and everything is safe. It's not because flood and fire are the worst destroyers of, you know, people's properties and properties. These are including photographs, memorabilia of, you know, their families and their parents. And, and basically for us, it's really important that those things can be saved, you know, for, for the, their, their, the generations of their next family, you know. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Kungif. Sure. Um, I think uh, we are overrunning a little, and I'm I'm sorry if we did not manage to get to all all of, of all of the questions. Uh, before we leave, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, yeah invite everyone to thank uh, Kungif for giving us such a one inspirational and wonderful lecture. Uh, thank you so much. Um, and before we leave, I'd like to share our next event, uh, our next chat time with everyone. So. Uh, this is happening next Saturday at the same time and uh, there is a link at the bottom left of this screen so uh, I would like to invite everyone here to also sign up for this chat time. Uh, this time we have um, Dr. Gwen, Gwen uh, Jenkins who is um, based in Penang and uh, yeah it's on the same theme of uh, yeah climate resilience and uh, this the title of this talk is actually uh, yeah based on her work on um, and and uh, it's on resilience futures right um, and we have uh, Ms. Ku Selma Nasutoshan uh, who is also vice president of uh, Penang Heritage Trust as well as um, uh, yeah uh, co-founder of Erika Books and uh, she is also part of the CCHA board of directors who will be moderating this talk so I would like to invite everyone to sign up and join us next Saturday as well. So uh, with that, uh, thank you all uh, very much for attending and for your active participation and questions. Uh, thank you very much, Kungi, for Thank you. Open talk. cap. Thank Open you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you.